Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we're going to talk about this continued move uh, on to sort of a risk-off positioning. Friday, we saw the rotation lower. Monday, of course, U.S. holiday. So today, we're back to trading gap lower earlier in the day, sort of rallying midday. Weakness in materials and energy really pushing the market lower, even though the XLY having a pretty decent update. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for our show as we break down the market activity, focusing on the message the markets provide back to us in the form of price action. John Murphy taught us all years and years ago, technical analysis has validity in the, uh, in the analytical toolkit because price is fact. Price tells us a lot about fear and greed, about the emotional interplay between different investors, how that nets out to price changes. So what we'll like to do on the final bar is focus on what we learned in terms of price action. Today, a little bit weaker and continuing on the weakness we saw on Friday, we've sort of charted this uh, exceptional run in the leadership of the markets, those growth-oriented sectors like technology, communication services. Now, one of those consumer discretionary having a nice uptake, up about three quarters of a, of a percent, but the average stock struggling a little bit today. Is this the beginning of maybe a recognition of the seasonal weakness that usually happens June into July for the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ? That remains to be seen. But let's focus on what actually happened with the charts here today. Let's get into our market recap. I do want to start with a poll question, by the way. We always have a poll running uh, on our, uh, <laughs> we send it out via social media. So make sure you follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get all of our poll questions. We asked you recently, know your behavioral biases. Which bias deals with the fact that your investment performance always looks better and better in the rear view mirror? 50% of you, absolutely right. Hindsight bias is the answer. What hindsight bias does is it causes you to basically improve your performance in your own head. The farther something goes into the rear view mirror, the farther away we get from things, the farther that time goes on and on, our recollection of our own investment performance actually improves. If you ask people right as something has happened, how they did, then ask them a year or two later, their performance is usually a little bit better because our memory sort of helps us nurture our fragile ego and make us feel better about poor decisions. Confirmation bias and prospect theory both deal in a related way with this sort of thing. Confirmation bias de deals with how we actually consume information and how we attribute uh, our decisions to uh, bullish or bearish inputs that we might receive. Prospect theory really deals with how we uh, struggle with loss, right? Losing feels a lot worse than uh, winning feels good. Rear view mirror bias is one that I made up. So as always, I'm, I'm putting one in there that I'm finding there's a, there's a market for rear view mirror bias. I'll try to invent that and, uh, and publicize it at some point. But for now, what you're thinking of is hindsight bias. The way that you uh, treat that or way that you minimize that, by the way, is to track your trades, track your performance, and go back and review them consistently. That is what mindful investors do. And I hope, Final Bar Nation, that you make time uh, during the year to do so. Let's continue on with our market recap. As I mentioned, a bit of a risk-off feel to things today. The S&P finishing the day down about half a percent. So not an end-of-the-world day, not the sky is falling kind of day, but certainly not a bullish follow-through. And that's a real difference from what we've seen, right? Some of the leading names like NVIDIA, like Apple, Microsoft, uh, a, a lot of similar sort of large-cap growth stocks have had such strong runs. What you're looking for is, in my opinion, is once you have an established trend, which we do, is you look for signs that that trend is maybe changing. So for today, the S&P down about half a percent. I'd need to see much more than that to start to be really skeptical of the trend reversing or, or skeptical of the trend continuing. Uh, but for now, that's, that's where we're at, just below 4,390, so back below 4,400 for the S&P 500. The NASDAQ composite down about 0.2 percent. You can see the Dow down 0.7 percent. Pretty much everything in the, uh, in the red today, even the mega cap uh, S&P S&P 100, the NASDAQ 100, about as large cap and growthy as you can get, still uh, about flat for the day, still above uh, 15,000. Volatility popping up a little bit, but still very, very low. A VIX around 14, 13 is exceptionally low if you look at the last 18 months as a sort of frame of reference. Go back a little further to 2021, though, and you can see what a long-term bull phase starts to look like. 2021 was an extended uptrend, a consistent move of higher highs and higher lows, minimal drawdowns and pretty low volatility. And now we're actually back in that range. We're actually low end of the range that we saw in 2021, uh, which is uh, you know, maybe noteworthy. 
Well, let's look at some other asset classes here very quickly. You know, when I'm asked about growth stocks and the growth leadership and what would tell me that the bullish phase is now exhausted, one of the things I would look for is risk off uh, positioning, right? Defensive positioning. People going to the relative fetal position of trying to find something to ride out periods of uncertainty. Places you would tend to think of would be uh, the bond markets. Uh, and then hard assets like gold and silver. Let's look at each of those here. Bond price is actually moving higher. So while stock's coming off today, the TLT, which is a long bond ETF, actually moving higher by about 0.7%. You can see the yield curve, of course, moving lower. So when bond prices are going higher, that means yields are actually rotating lower. The 10-year yield uh, is down to around 373, not too far above that, the uh, long bond yield around 382. Dollar index up by about a quarter of a percent. That might be another thing to look at. The dollar index potentially making a sort of double bottom of sorts here in 2023. See if we get further rally uh, to the upside. The story of 2022 in more of a risk off year was the dollar strong and pretty much everything else down. So do we see an improvement in the dollar? And does that tell us uh, that there is a, a move lower impending for risk assets? Maybe a start of that, but not enough, I think, to really move the needle in that direction just yet. Speaking of commodities and the red, the color red, we have gold and silver both moving to the downside. The GLD down about 1%. We covered that last week talking about the chart of gold, this sort of trend channel that we've seen on gold prices and other precious metals as well. We're now breaking below the lower end of that trend channel. Same can be said for silver, actually down 4% today. That's using the SLV. Some of the commodity ETFs were up uh, just slightly, but overall the commodity complex uh, weaker and oil prices moving down as well. The energy sector struggling quite a bit. Now with cryptocurrencies, as always, I, I tell you, if you enjoy volatility and uncertainty, you probably really love uh, the crypto world because there are a lot of sudden movements. Uh, you know, in the last uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen all sorts of news flow, both bullish and bearish for major cryptocurrencies. Where are we at today? Bitcoin is actually up about 4.3%, we'll call it, just below 28,000 right now. Now 30,000 is sort of that big significant level where we traded up to, we stalled out and then pushed lower. Now we're bouncing off of a key Fibonacci level. We actually published a chart on this about uh, Ether prices last week and Bitcoin, I think, moving very similar to, uh, to Ethereum right now. We'll look at the chart of Bitcoin here in a minute. If we can, Ether just above 1780, that's up 2.6% from uh, Friday's close. Looking at sectors here very briefly, as I mentioned in the intro, you have consumer discretionary positive, pretty much everything else in the red. Uh, the XLY was up 0.8%. Uh, you know, leading names like Tesla having a pretty good day, that's going to help the XLY move higher. You have to remember that things like the XLY, the XLK, even the XLE are very top heavy. Those popular um, uh, sector ETFs, many of them are very, very top heavy, meaning they are heavily weighted to a couple names, two or three at the most. So about 50% of the XLY is Amazon, Tesla, Home Depot. About 50% of the XLK is Apple and Microsoft. And, and that is a good thing when those stocks are doing well. But if and when those stocks start to struggle, look out below because the whole ETF basically gets dragged down because those mega cap names uh, might be struggling a bit. With that being said, the XLY having a nice update. Everything else flat to down. Healthcare was number two, and then communication services. And healthcare not far away from uh, being uh, up on the day. On the downside, this is what really uh, hurt uh, the uh, S&P, the XLE, the energy sector, down 2.3%. Energy, again, we keep talking about the potential return to the leadership from energy. Same with materials, right? There was a time in the last year where we're talking about Nucor, talking about steel dynamics and all these steel names with exceptional charts that were just continuing to go higher. At one point, a lot of the top 10 scooter rank stocks our proprietary uh, stock charts technical ranking. We're in the materials sector. Uh, boy, that is a that is a long gone day. That is uh, that is uh, way in the rearview mirror, as they say. The XLB down 1.4 percent as well. And utilities and real estate, two pretty defensive sectors uh, down as well. So this was not a big flood to the exits, risk off type of move, but more kind of everything besides the XLY having a bit bit of a rough go of it today. Let us go to the chart of the S&P 500 and see what actually played out today, as I, uh, as I mentioned right uh, recently. It's all about that 4,300 level, right? And that was the high from August. That was a key Fibonacci level. And I say was 
because we broke through that a couple weeks ago. And I think getting through, getting to 4,300 was pretty significant. Breaking through 4,300, even more important. You can see it continue to rally higher. Friday's high was around 4,450. So for now, that's your high for the year because we came off just a little bit uh, today down around 4,388, uh, 89. Now, here's the thing, right? If we do get a pullback, if we get further deterioration, if growth stocks really start to struggle a bit and go in pullback mode, it's going to drag the major benchmarks down. So I always think about short-term versus long-term support levels. Short-term, 4,300 seems like a really obvious uh, potential support level. And that's this pink-shaded area goes from 4,300 to 4,325. 4,325 was the intraday high from August. 4,310 is the Fibonacci level we've talked about. I, I kind of group 4,300 in there just as a big round number. And that's kind of the potential support range. So if we do pull back, which seems more and more likely on a day like today... That's where I would start to look for short-term support. There is a scenario where we hold that sort of level and rotate higher, and this is just yet another higher low within a, a string of higher lows that we've seen over the last uh, over the last uh, eight months or so. There is a more bearish uh, outcome here, and that would be 4,300 does not hold. And that's why that's a key level. That's why it's an important level uh, on the chart here. If that holds, this is a very viable pullback, most likely. It's a short-term pullback within an uptrend. That sort of level fails, and then you have to start look a little further down. So what levels would be more, most meaningful going lower? A couple come to mind. The next obvious one would be 4,200. That's the uh, February high. That was the level we talked a lot about in April and May because that's where the uptrend had stalled out. That's also the 50-day moving average. In general, kind of back of the envelope, we're in a pullback. What do you do next? I often think about the 50-day moving average. Inclining 50-day is a great starting point, right? That's a good obvious pullback because it's usually enough of a pullback that it feels like something's changed, but not so bad that it feels like the world's ending uh, just yet. So I think that's a reasonable uh, downside target. That's about, what, 5% below current levels. Go a little further, and then you're getting down into some longer term support levels. I think it, when, if, if the S&P gets down to around 4050, that would be a trend line from the October low and the March low gets uh, currently around 4050. So depending on how quickly we would sell off, that's where this uh, this level could come into play because it you know could continue to increase if we spend some time up around current levels. The 200-day moving average is currently around 4,000, uh, just below there. So we're sort of that that would be the next sort of long-term level that I would be considering. Now, why are we talking about pullbacks? Very simply, the S&P was overbought until today, right? Going into the weekend, the long weekend. It was, all right, the S&P is now overbought. Many individual stocks are overbought. Those leadership names, do they come out of that overbought region? That's happening today. So, again, tomorrow could totally change this if we revert back to the upside. But for now, it starts to feel like the pullback scenario is, uh, is going to be engaged here. And it makes me immediately think about downside potential targets and how I might want to manage risk between now and 4,000, right? What, what levels, where, where would you need to take some uh, bets off the table to make sure you protect yourself in the event of uh, further downside there. Now, I teased the chart of uh, Bitcoin. Let's go there now and just uh, look at it. Uh, I was talking, uh, I was exchanging some notes with Adrian Zadunchik, who's been on uh, Stock Charts TV a number of times. I actually did some great educational content. I think we, we put some of that out. We'll probably put some more out uh, very soon. Uh, expert in cryptocurrencies. We talked about Bitcoin and Ethereum. We're talking about the Ether chart. But what's interesting about the Bitcoin chart, look at the November 2022 low, which is just below 16,000. It's really around 15,500. Look at the April high, which is right around 31,000. And really, I would consider this an attempt to get above 30,000 that kind of failed. We then rotated lower, and the pattern we've been talking about is sort of this head and shoulders topping pattern, which is the high in April, lower highs in May and March. We broke the neckline, we're going lower. What's happened now, though, is in the last week or two, we found support right around 25,000. The reason why that's an important level in my analysis is because that is a 38.2% retracement of the way back down to the November low. So here's the big move higher. We've retraced to the first Fibonacci support level, and now we're bouncing upwards in a big way. Today, after the weekend sort of chopping around, we're rotating higher. And as we're uh, you know, doing this show after the U.S. equity close on Tuesday, we're seeing Bitcoin and the Ethereum uh, prices move to the upside back above the 50-day moving average. So question number one, do we hold the 50-day? And if so, this certainly seems to be a short-term support level. 
upside at the least back up to 30,000 to retest those previous highs and see if we can break through there. But overall, the chart of Bitcoin going from looking fairly dire a week or two ago to now starting to find support. The momentum is improving as well with the RSI getting just above 60. So this could be the beginning of a, of a broader recovery. We think it is. We think the long-term opportunity uh, for Bitcoin certainly, certainly is there. But in the short term, it was just showing weakness over strength. Now you're starting to see a flip of that. We're seeing some improvement. Let's finish off our market recap looking at some individual stocks that are on the move and what it might mean for you and your an analysis, your portfolios. Enphase Energy is a stock we talked about a lot in 2022 because it was doing quite well while the average stock was struggling quite a bit. This is a group called Renewable Energy Equipment. It includes solar names, hydrogen names, sort of uh, those types of stocks. We bucket them in the technology sector, although I've seen them placed in energy in other places uh, as well. So Enphase down about 5.4% uh, today, so not a good day, underperforming the S&P and the NASDAQ by a pretty significant uh, margin. What's interesting, though, again, when I see a day like this, I always want to think about the bigger picture. What is the trend overall? What, in what context are we seeing a sort of down day like this? And when you take a step back, you can see that we rallied off of the May low to test a descending, a declining 50-day moving average. Look at the RSI. The momentum stalled out right here around 60. So while today's move is certainly significant, the fact that it's more risk off, the fact that it's more in a bearish phase, I think makes sense. And that's been the story before today, right? I think last week, you could sort of see the signs of weakened momentum of, of, the, of the stock instead of really reclaiming a key resistance level, it's sort of stalling out there. Now we're seeing a rotation lower. Overall, I would say that this chart is still in a downtrend until proven otherwise. Sort of the, you know, Apple, Microsoft NVIDIA chart flipped over, right? Sort of the, the bias is more negative until we get some sort of an uh, improvement. What's interesting is other stocks in that group, like Solar Edge, this is a solar name, uh, we can see rotating to the downside as well, making a new six month low. Now, this isn't a particularly strong chart in general, right? This has been a weaker chart and it's been more sideways uh, and basing for, for a long time, for multiple years now. But you can see once again, we're rotating down to the lower end of this range, a lot of downside below the support levels we just broke to get to previous levels of support down in the low 200s. Now, it's not all just uh, renewable energy struggling. The uh, established energy stocks are struggling as well. It's interesting that the chart of uh, Enphase and the chart of Devon Energy have a similar feel to it, right? A basing pattern, a rally stalling out at a declining 50-day moving average and a big down day today. Days like this, rotating down from resistance, just tells me that that bearish phase is not quite done, right? The way that you can tell that things are different, what we call a change of characters, because the conditions change, right? Instead of trading up to resistance, you trade through it. Instead of the momentum staying more negative, staying below 50 or 60, we rotate higher. And you'd love to see a chart like DVN rotate back to the upside. We are not seeing it yet. That's it from our market recap. We're going to come back here in a second, answering questions from the final bar mailbag. Just a quick announcement uh, in the middle here. First off, we love to hear your feedback on our show, on our guests, on how we're providing you content and, uh, and uh, analysis over the uh, YouTube platform, but especially, we love your questions. What are you running into as you are analyzing your own charts and your own technical indicators? Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and on our Stock Charts TV YouTube channel, just drop a comment below the video that you're watching. We'd love to hear from you. Hope to answer your question on our next mailbag on Friday show of this week. With that in mind, let's get to our final bar mailbag. Thanks again, all of you, for sending in questions. Keep them coming. And here's the first question for the day. Dave, how do I use the S&P PE indicators on the Stock Charts platform? And you sent a chart along with you. Thanks so much for that. Uh, it's always helpful, by the way, to uh, send an image. Even better is a permalink. So below the chart uh, on uh, Sharp Charts on the ACP platform, just click on the share button and you can send that link. Copy that URL into your question and then I'll know exactly. I can actually see a live version of the chart that you're looking at on my own login. But this is the image that you sent in, which is a, a beautiful chart, sort of looking at the, uh, the sunset uh, back Background, which I think is a pretty cool uh, color scheme for sure. But here's what you're doing here. And if, you're, if you've not seen these before, we have these different indexes uh, called S&P PE. And then there's a 20, a 15, and a green. Now, you've color-coded these green, yellow, and red. And you can see the words in the, uh, in the description for these indexes. 10, undervalued, 15, fair value, 20, overvalued. And you can see the lines here on the chart. So what are we looking at here? This is a chart of the S&P 500. This looks like a weekly chart of the S&P. Yeah, weekly chart of the S&P. We're going back uh, quite a bit, around 20 years. 
So we're looking at the S&P on a closing basis. The red line is basically where the S&P would be trading at a 20 PE multiple, meaning the index is trading at 20 times the earnings of the aggregate stocks that make up the S&P 500, right? So in any stock, the PE ratio is the price, the current price divided by the most recent quarterly earnings or an estimated uh, earnings number. There's a lot of different schools of thought on that. I think for this, we're using a 12, trailing 12 months uh, uh, PE or uh, earnings uh, earnings level. So right now we're currently trading at a PE around 25, and you've actually calculated that by looking at dividing the S&P value by an index that we track of the S&P gap earnings. So you can see the PE ratio spiked here in 2009 and 2010 because companies all of a sudden were not making money in a big way, and so the PE ratio spikes up because there's not a lot of earnings and the price is still fairly elevated relative to the earnings that we're getting. After the financial crisis, things sort of normalize, and for a little bit of time, we actually were trading right around a 15 to 20 PE. Look at what's happened recently. So when you hear people talking about the uh, markets being overvalued, from a technical perspective, a lot of times we talk about the price being overbought, right? But another way of thinking of that is looking at the overvalued, uh, by defining overvalued is not just on price, but price relative to some fundamental data. So price to earnings, price to sales, price to book value if you're looking at certain types of stocks. So these bands were added to the platform years ago as a general shorthand of thinking if the S&P's PE gets down to 10, we're probably undervalued relative to historical averages. If the PE's at 20, we're overvalued. You can see what's happened over the last 10 years. We've spent pretty much the entire time well above that upper band. So we've talked about, should we add additional bands for 25, 30, 35? Might be a sign of the times when we actually get around to adding those additional band indexes. That's when we won't see those multiples ever again. So I'm hesitant to do that because I don't want to ruin a good thing. But that is what you're basically doing. It's a shorthand, a visual cue of just showing where we at right now. So you can chart a, a PE ratio for the S&P, which is what you've done here, or just overlay these bands. And then you can see where we're at. And so you can visually see about 25 uh, PE because here's 15, here's 20, and here's where we're at. If we would sell off a little bit or if earnings would really improve and price remain stable, the PE multiple comes down, we'll get back into that quote unquote normal range. But I would say the normal range in earnings for the S&P or, or PE ratios have not been the normal range over the last uh, 10 years. And that's why we're sort of outside of those bands. Hope that answers your question. And thank you so much for sending that in with an image. Uh, really easy to follow your question that way. Question number two. Dave, is that a bull flag pattern on the 10-year yield? You had a, a number of other points in your question. I appreciate you so much uh, sending that in. This was the chart that you included using our annotations tool. And that's actually a really uh, important point to, to note. One of the great things you can do on the Sharp Charts platform and on ACP as well is you can add comments. So what you did is actually, if you click on annotate, there's a couple different things that you can do. You can do a note, which just puts a text on there. You're actually doing a call out feature. It makes it this little sort of speech bubble type of looking thing. Uh, pretty helpful if you wanna focus on a particular point and a, an idea or a concept, a trade, uh, and an indicator and what it means. This is a really good way to capture that. Save it to a chart list so you'll always have that. That's how I actually use um, charts in my own investing. I have chart lists that track my own personal investment decisions, my trades, my portfolio, and I use this tool uh, uh, heavily to sort of track where I'm at and what levels are most important to me. So uh, good use of the, uh, and the annotations engine for sure. Now, what you're talking about is this weekly chart of the 10-year yield. Is this a bull flag uh, formation? So the short answer is maybe. The somewhat longer-winded answer, and the reason why I have to say maybe, is because it's not a confirmed flag. And you actually put in your, in your, in your uh, annotation here, is this building a flag formation? I would say potentially, right? So what we would say by the book is this is a potential bullish flag. And the reason why you can say it's a potential bullish flag is because we've had a rally. There's been a context of an uptrend. And now we're getting this parallel channel against the longer term trend, lower highs, lower lows, right? So think of it as the flagpole. And then here's the flag kind of uh, angling down. So what that tells you is we've had the big run and now we're sort of consolidating. Now we're sort of lightening up. The question is, what's next? So the way that this pattern usually resolves is to the upside, but it's not a valid, it's not a confirmed bull flag until we break above that upper trend line. And that's why I can't say, yes, that's a bull flag pattern. You have to technically say it is a potential bull flag. It's, it's maybe forming a bull flag, and this is what would convince me uh, that it is. So you'd really have to get a 10-year yield above around 4% to break out of this range to the upside. Now, having said that, are weekly charts looking at interest rates my favorite place to consider a flag pattern? 
Probably not. You know, these sorts of patterns really were popularized by uh, Edwards and McGee in their, uh, in their book, Technical Analysis of Stock Trends. It's a brilliant book. And if you've not read it, uh, it was one of the first books written on technical analysis that was widely distributed. It is a masterpiece uh, of, uh, of work in the technical analysis uh, literature, uh, focusing on price patterns and, and price behavior and what that actually means. Um, they focus their analysis, of course, on individual stocks and, and, and recognizing that the patterns emerge because they quantify behavioral trends. Something like the 10-year yield is less subject to supply and demand and more subject to a lot of other things, a lot of macro drivers, a lot of macro inputs, arguably manipulation by things like the Federal Reserve, right? So I'm, I'm less... Uh, I'm less a fan of using flags in this uh, in this particular context. However, if you're okay with using flags on a weekly uh, on a weekly chart of the 10-year yield, 100%. Now, one thing you didn't mention in your question, I think, is really important, is the weekly MACD or the weekly PPO. You've highlighted that in green. The fact that we've gotten a buy signal here in the last couple of weeks, I think, out of all the things on your chart, that's what's the most interesting to me because what this starts to suggest are higher interest rates from here, lower bond prices, and what that also probably means is a tough, uh, a tough stretch for, uh, for growth stocks. In general, when rates have been going up, that's not particularly good for growth stocks. Uh, so we'll have to see if that trend continues, uh, if we get a, a rotation lower in uh, the leadership names in 2023. Great chart, by the way. Thanks for sending that in, and thanks for sharing the uh, permalink when you did it. Next question. When do you trade a bearish divergence, i.e., when do you pull the trigger? Um, and you, you sent in a very uh, a long question with a lot of ideas about uh, you know, different divergences. You mentioned the bank nifty chart, uh, uh, tracking uh, some financial stocks in the India, Indian market. What's good about these sorts of uh, indicators, to be honest with you, very few of the indicators, if, I mean, very, very few of the indicators that I show you in terms of price-based indicators, uh, they're all relevant for pretty much anything that has liquidity and has price history. So if you're looking at an in Indian stock or Vodafone in the UK or you know, Rogers Telecom in Canada or AMD here in the US, the technical indicators are all sort of universal, right? They really are um, uh, universally uh, applicable as long as there's enough history and enough, uh, enough data transparency, or I guess enough liquidity. Where you run into trouble is with uh, frontier markets, with you know, pink sheets, off over-the-counter U.S. names where they're so illiquid that there's not a lot of reliable price data. That's where you can run into trouble with some of these indicators that rely on a good amount of data. But something like the Bank Nifty uh, chart in India, 100% uh, fair. So I'm using a chart of AMT just as an example, but I think what I'm about to share with you is, is uh, you know, should be universally applicable to liquid stocks and ETFs. ETFs. What you have to remember is we had this bearish divergence of higher highs May into June and lower peaks of momentum. We actually highlighted this chart last week on the show, so I thought this would be a good one to, uh, to bring up. The question is now what? So I, I sort of bucket indicators, technical indicators, into leading indicators and lagging indicators. Leading indicators are things that anticipate a move. There are things like RSI, Things like, um, you know, arguably things like uh, Fibonacci retracements, which anticipate a particular level as having meaning, a particular uh, movement as telling you we're at the end, we're at the exhaustion point. But it doesn't tell you something has already happened, right? It tells you something may be coming very soon. Indicators like Tom DeMarc's sequential indicator is really more, I guess, coincident. It's really trying to pinpoint a turn, which is incredibly difficult to do, but I haven't seen uh, a lot of great examples of, of indicators that are consistent besides those that, uh, that have consistently uh, you know, uh, been able to identify turning points. The rest of the technical toolkit is more lagging indicators. So the RSI giving a bearish divergence is a leading indicator. That tells you that we are showing similar patterns to previous tops, not, on, not just on this stock, but on any, uh, on any technical uh, chart. What you now need to look for, in my opinion, is look for confirmation, right? What would tell you, now that this is on a watch list, what would tell you that things are really starting to deteriorate? General things that I would look at would be an indicator like PPO or MACD, which is more of a trend following indicator. That's not going to signal a sell until the price is actually already rotating lower. That's what we've not seen enough yet on AMD, but we might look at the indicator PPO and, and, and make your own decision. But that would be another thing I would, uh, I would look at. Also look to see if support holds, right? So if you look, we gapped higher uh, to around 115. That happened there in uh, mid-May. We pulled back to around 115, 116. Do those levels hold on any sort of short-term pullback? As long as that does, then the trend is still up by uh, definition. We break that, and all of a sudden, we're starting to confirm the fact that things are rotating. So 
If you're looking at divergences, I think you found a good leading indicator of price reversals. Now I would combine that with the power of a lagging indicator that helps you minimize whipsaws. It helps you confirm which of the trades that are really playing out. Now, the way you actually trade them, that is up to you and how risky or how risk averse or uh, what your risk appetite really is. And what I mean is I've seen some people that short something or sell something on the divergence, maybe put f half of the position on and then complete it once we confirm it. What that means is you're getting in earlier, but you're basically risking that it doesn't work. And so you either use the confirmation indicator as an entry point or you use it as a way to confirm and, and fulfill the complete position. It all depends on how aggressive you want to be as you're trading around some of these different positions. Thanks so much for that question, by the way. And I posted a, a video to my YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior talking about leading versus lagging indicators, which might be helpful for you as well. Next question. Small caps and home builders both had a bearish engulfing pattern last week, then went higher. Is that just a false indication? What gives? You didn't say that. I added that last part on my own. But, um, but basically, no, you're pointing to this. Let's look at, uh, let's see, 8XHB will bring up. We haven't looked at home builders uh, in a little while. And I'll bring up my candle focus chart, which is just a chart style that focuses on that. I think you're talking about this pattern right here, which is indeed a bearish engulfing pattern. Remember, a bearish engulfing pattern has to be in an uptrend. You have a big up day and then a big down day. The day two body, the real body from open to close, engulfs the first day's real body. Another good example of that is here, sort of mid-May. Uh, in an uptrend, big up day, big down day. Day two engulfs day one. That's a short-term sell signal. Here we have the same pattern. This one worked magnificently. This one did not. So what happened? So I will tell you this. I, and, I, and it's so funny, when I post charts like this and they don't work, I'll get at least one person that says, well, it doesn't work. And I would say, look, nothing works 100% of the time. I'm happy with things that work more than they don't. And I'm happy having multiple inputs and helping me focus on things. I, I'm not showing you anything that works 100% of the time. I wish I had that. If I did, I would probably use it on my own, but I would probably, I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty giving person. I would probably share it with you uh, as well. But not, that does not exist. That holy grail indicator does not exist. So I would say technical analysis is all about having a consistent process to identify potential turns, but also having a good money management strategy. Uh, you know, uh, successful investors have told me many different uh, mentors of mine, you know, it's not about being right. It's about admitting when you're wrong and making a change, right? Doing something about it. The worst thing you can do is be wrong and stay wrong. Or as one of my, my former bosses used to say, it's okay to be wrong. It's not okay to stay wrong. So the way that you don't stay wrong is if you take a short position based on this bearish engulfing pattern, which I would say was a completely valid pattern then hopefully you're stopped out by now or you have some way of managing that risk. So how do you actually manage risk? So just using the uh, bullet bearish engulfing pattern on its own, what I was taught by Steve Nissen, who's credited for you know, bringing uh, candlestick analysis to the West, bringing it from Japan where he learned it, uh, to Western technical analysts where it's become more, much more widespread, is to take the high of that two-bar pattern. So as long as we remain below that high, which we technically still have, then the signal is still valid. Um, if we would break that high, then the signal is, is no longer valid. You're stopped out just based on the natural structure of that pattern. So for now, what it would basically be saying, if you just use this signal in a vacuum, is you're short home builders, you're in cash, and you're waiting to, for a break above 77 to invalidate that sell signal. We haven't seen that uh, yet. Now, other people like, uh, like Tom DeMarc, Larry Williams, uh, Tom in, in particular comes to mind, uh, will have what he calls a time stop. Some of his indicators, if a, if a signal has not played out within 12 bars or within X number of days, you would exit the position just because it's not doing what you expected. Justin Mamis uh, famously said, he's written a number of really good books on, uh, on market analysis and technical analysis. If the stock isn't doing what you expect it to, sell it and move on to something else. I'm paraphrasing uh, Mamis's uh, quote. So that would be, I would use a combination of those things. Number one, use the height of the, the top part of that pattern as a stop. It's still engaged for now. I haven't looked at uh, IWM, but I would be looking at that. And if it gets above there, that basically says to exit. Other than that, use other indicators like a time stop, other support and resistance levels as a way to validate that signal that you saw. Final question, is there a way to filter scooter rankings for stocks that have changed their scooter ranking the most? Really interesting question, by the way. Um, I would not use our scanning engine for that, although you can. So you can use the scanning engine and actually look for changes in a scooter ranking as one of your arguments. I actually like to use our scooter reports for that. So if you go to charts and tools in the right column, go to this guy right here, which is called scooter reports. It's in that uh, second section down. 
Now this is a simple uh, you know, table of data. You can pick which report you're looking at. So we default to large cap US stocks. You can switch to ETFs, US industries, or other global markets if that's where you're focusing your time. And you can sort all of these columns. So right now, it's sorting on intraday, um, you know, the current rankings. But if I click on change, I'm looking at the biggest uh, drops intraday, so from yesterday's close to today, or the biggest gainers. You can also look at one week change. You can say the biggest gainers over the last week, the biggest losers over the last week. This is actually a simple feature that I use heavily because it's all about where a stock is ranked on its scooter rankings, which tells you over time where the trend is relative to similar stocks. It's really a relative strength uh, tool. But looking at the changes in the scooter ranking can be really interesting because that's where you can capture things that have really been beaten down that really start to improve. And while it doesn't necessarily say that Coinbase, Southwest, and Teleflex should be your big three uh, buy ideas today, it tells you to look at those charts and understand what changed for the scooter ranking to be so weak and all of a sudden rotate in a much stronger position in a very short amount of time in about a week. So focus on those scooter reports and you can do the same thing with industries, with ETFs, and that can be a great way to identify leadership changes and when you start to see a rotation in some of those uh, big picture items you might be looking at. That is it for our mailbag. And folks, I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. All of those questions, by the way, came from people like you. And let's wrap the show with our three in three, three charts in three minutes to tell the story of this market environment. Chart number one is the semiconductor ETF, SMH. What I wanted to think about with the, uh, with the semiconductor space, I've had a lot of questions in the media over the last week uh, about uh, the growth, growth space and leadership and large cap growth and have we seen the end of it. My short answer is all of those names are overbought. The markets themselves are overbought and I'm concerned about uh, the potential upside uh, from here, right? There's no denying the trends have been strong from where they started in October, uh, somewhere in the third, fourth quarter of last year to where they're at today. The question is how much further we to go from here. And when I see a lot of those stocks becoming overbought, when I see things like the SMH, like the S&P, like the NASDAQ facing significant overhead resistance, I have to be skeptical about further upside from here. Now, we've talked about it in particular names like Apple and Microsoft and others. We've looked at divergences and how they might play out. But let's look at the SMH, the Semiconductor ETF, and the fact that we've now round tripped Back to all-time highs. The SMH last made a new all-time high in the fourth quarter of 2021. This is when semiconductors were really doing well, leading the market higher. You see the relative strength really improved going into the fourth quarter. 2021, 2022, that is, of course, the semiconductor space, along with most growth stocks and, and most stocks in general, were struggling in a big-time way. That all changed. We can see this head and shoulders bottoming pattern or an inverted head and shoulders that was validated. And then we've continued to move higher, higher highs and higher lows. Now those higher highs have reached the all-time highs. So can semiconductors continue on without a pause and just blow right to the upside? Of course they could. Is there a much liker, a much more likely scenario where they at least have a pullback from these levels? Yes. I would argue what we see on a day like today may be the beginning of a, bit of a deeper drawdown. The market could go higher. The semiconductor space could push higher and the SMH could get above 160. But a brief pullback, even if you're really bullish on this space, would probably be the most important thing to see because that could reset this uptrend and put in a big time higher low. That's the springboard to make new all time highs from it. So the RSI was overbought just coming out of that overbought region today. I think this is an important space to watch, certainly through the remainder of this holiday week. Chart number two, Tesla, the XLY, the best performing uh, S&P sector today, in no small part because of Tesla being up over 5%, around 275 right now. And I'm looking at the last uh, two years just to show how extremely overbought Tesla is. Now, two things that I would say when a stock is extremely overbought. Number one, that means it's gone up a ton. And that's good news if you own something like Tesla. It also often means that the uptrend is not over. Usually when you're extremely overbought, you often will get a brief pullback, but you'll accelerate and actually push at least one more high. A lot of times that creates that bearish divergence. Fibonacci analysis tells us 220 was a key level, which we now broke through. 300 to 310 is the next upside level, not too far above current levels. That's where I might anticipate further resistance on this outperforming name. Finally, we've talked about gold and the struggles in the material space and the commodity space, precious metals in particular. Here we're looking at the chart of silver. Look at the peak around 24, the bounce off of 21 on the SLV. That's a Fibonacci level from the September low. And the April and May high, we bounced off of 21. 
We hit the uh, 50 day moving average. We're now rotating lower yet again. We break that 21 level. Next expected level for me, the 200 day moving average around 2050. But Fibonacci analysis tells you you may be going even further down around 1944. Just like the S&P, I think on charts like silver and gold, putting a trend line off of the lows might give us a really interesting uh, support level to pay attention to. Currently around 20, uh, 19 something, $20 or so, depending on how quickly we sell off. That might be the ultimate support level uh, for, the, uh, for the silver space. The other thing that I would note on the chart of SLV, uh, by the way, is the fact that the momentum has not been particularly strong. We had this bearish momentum divergence April into May. The price really didn't make a higher high. It was more stable. But look at how the, the, the uh, divergence uh, uh, played out with the momentum actually sloping downward over, downwards over that period. That tells us that the uptrend is likely exhausted. That's kind of what we're seeing now with charts like AMD and others with that bearish divergence. Now that we've rotated lower, you can see that the momentum is remaining below 60 on a rally phase. That is way classic configuration for a bearish trend. I think the weight of the evidence is still bearish until proven otherwise. Folks, that's a wrap for this show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. All of our previous episodes are on our YouTube channel, so make sure you check out some of our previous interviews with some of the top experts in the financial markets. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow.